Okay, good evening. Welcome to another episode of Photography After Hours. And we have some great topics we're going to talk about here. And uh, I'd like to introduce our very special second host here, Scott. Welcome. Hey. Good to see you. Good to Good see to you. Be here. <laughs> Hopefully all this stuff works. We don't have anyone over there. We're doing all the yeah, It's the a bit live of a technical switching. nightmare right now. We'll get through it. <laughs> Ball head's not working over here. We made everything super, super simple, which in turn makes it super complicated. Yeah, once we get it dialed and everything's locked down, then it's going to be super simple. Right now, I'm we're sure still working the bugs out. Sure, this light down here will die. It already died once while we were fixing stuff. Yeah. It'll so, be uh, what it's going to be. Hang in with us. <laughs> So, um, so a little bit about this episode. So this episode, we're going to talk about uh, First Fridays briefly. Um, we're going to discuss a, uh, a little bit about full frames and debunk some of the myths maybe that you've been sold on and some of the reasons maybe to or to not use a full frame and, um, and then just chat a little bit. So, uh, you know, so how's everything been going with you? So good. So let's talk First Friday first. Let's, let's, let's promote that a little bit because... I think a lot of people, when they think First Fridays, they only think Roosevelt Row. It's much bigger than that. It's a, it's a citywide thing. A lot of the galleries in the area all have, uh, have things going on. A lot of the Well, tell the them galleries. what city we're in first. So this is Phoenix, Arizona, obviously. <laughs> I don't know. A, a lot of cities, not a lot of cities really do a First Friday. You hear about it occasionally, but I'll talk to people who have just moved to town. They're like, what are you talking about? What's a First Friday? What does that even mean? And so what it means... So for anyone who doesn't know, is a kind of a on the first Friday of the month in the evening. It's a uh, uh, it's a festival about art. It's about seeing other people's art and people displaying it. And so so here at Parkwood Studios, we're going to we've done it once. We did it, it was September, right? September's first Friday. Yeah. So technically, we actually did a first Friday last year, but we didn't promote it as that very rarely. But it was yeah. actually our Christmas party. Okay. It was on first Friday and. Nader and I kind of and Susie discussed that and we're like, well, it kind of falls there and it's Christmas and it's yeah, first yeah. Friday and we had 350 plus people showed up and it's crazy. <laughs> Brian made uh, Brian made beef or whatever the oh, heck. He barbecued pork and <laughs> it disappeared. Just ate a, just the pork and I know, yeah, right? I think I think ASMP walked out with uh, one whole tray like, all right, guys, I <laughs> gotta, gotta go. go. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so yeah, so we have done a first Friday, but it wasn't yeah. really an art show. Um, People brought stuff, and that's where we yeah. got the idea this year of doing an actual First Friday for right. them. So, so I think the first one in December, uh, Aurora O'Brien had some stuff hanging on the wall. Aurora, John Q, yeah. um, Ladie, people brought stuff, brought art, stuff. artwork, yeah. put it up on the walls, but it was dark, and it was a DJ and sort of, lights and it was lights. It was a party, yeah. It was more a party, so we didn't really get there. I felt they really didn't get there. Um, their money's worth out of it, out of coming down, hanging all their great artwork up. So when we came up with the other part of doing an actual First Friday this year, it was like, well, let's do it where it's a legit First Friday, and basically we can uh, hang art. Yep, and so we had the lights up, right? There was no DJ stuff, no, no loud DJ. music. We, well, we had a band. Um, so Andrew, it was, it was Andrew an had a band. Thing, right? yeah, yeah, Andrew uh, thing, Miller came fun. out with his... Uh, with his bandmate, and they played um, the middle of the event a little bit, played yep. some acoustic stuff, which was more the speed we were looking for. Yeah, the vibe um, that we were looking for. And we had uh, we also had a guy in stilts juggling, which was interesting. Yeah, so Jet um, came out and did um, juggling and some magic and some other stuff. I didn't see all of it. That was kind of cool. People were, were a little freaked out at first because the guy in stilts. <laughs> but I think after a while, it was like everyone thought it was cool, and he was going room to room, which was interesting to see, going through doorways. That was crazy. But uh, that worked out well, and so we had a lot of a lot of artists out there. I did some, I threw some stuff up on the wall. Uh, we had uh, several photographers that are members, and some people who were not members of the uh, Parkwood. Yeah. Uh, here, and it was it was really good. You had some stuff up. I yeah. I so you had a, you had a project that you've been doing over several years. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah. You had that stuff on display. Yeah, it's my selfie nude project. I, I like to do it when no one's around. Right. I, I did it in here in your chair, That's actually. That's why I was off, <laughs> off to the side a little bit. <laughs> Before you got here, I did it in your chair. I was yeah. just there. and Great. Just, uh, yeah. I, I got to go. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have, they print them. It's great. They yeah. print them large, put yeah. them on my wall. They'll print so anything, my bed. those people. <laughs> 
Uh, no, so my project, uh, I have a couple projects, but that particular two were up. Um, one was, uh, they were both kind of film-inspired kind of projects. So one was the cowboy project. So coming from New Jersey, I didn't see saguaros and westerns and, you know, besides just the standard stuff you see growing up as a kid, like Lone Ranger and stuff. So it was kind of like enamored with all of this uh cool western stuff and just started shooting all the cowboys of all the different went out to tombstone and goldfield and all these places and shot them and then i take this like 20 plus megapixel purely sharp amazing image and crumble it down and make it a grainy shitty vignetted old looking, <laughs> old looking image that was sepia so uh, you can find those on my instagram if you scroll way back and then the second images that were on the other wall were the film project that you helped me on mm -hmm. when we did a uh film like of old cameras like these cameras here we photographed uh, about 350 different cameras that you see um, all over the studio yeah. here and, and then you brought cameras in Patrick brought cameras yeah, in it. it was a big deal we, we had a lot of fun doing that. and same yeah. thing we took like crystal clear images with like GH5s and like you know ruined them so <laughs> and they look great no it was, and it was like a it's like a collage because you, you have uh, four images on, on a square format which yeah. is fun yeah, everything on that was Instagram, Square. I kind yeah. of been doing more of that. It's a harder box to work in, and um, as opposed to this shape, which we'll talk about full frame, but full frame is the shape of like a plasma screen sure. compared to an old TV. So I went kind of Instagram with it, and even though they're high quality, I shot them in Square format. My camera's able to go one-to-one, -one, and I shot them like that. So that was fun. We've got to do more. we got to go shoot Paul's cameras next time. Um, that's a museum over there. Yeah. yeah, we need to get into there and shoot some <laughs> so of that we, stuff. So we need to do that. So tell me Absolutely. about your stuff that you had up there. You had uh, so, a so good I, variety of product yeah, stuff. Yeah, I did some things. So I kind of got known for a while as being a guy who just shoots whiskey bottles. So I did. I put a couple of those up, and they were more of the, the landscape, or it was a whole set or scene that I would put together. Um, so I put some of those up there, and they, uh, a lot of people like those. And then I did this, just this um, it's a kind of fine art still life of just cutlery. Okay. And so we did some cutlery there, and it was just smooth gray backgrounds and just and lit up with super soft diffused light. Nice. And uh, it was very cool. So, yeah. So when you're, shooting, uh, when you're shooting the images, how long? So I was kind of bust. We just have to talk to Lindsay about shooting her car, and she's like, oh, I'll be there for like an hour or two. Yeah. Not, to, not to bag on Lindsay, but it was like, you know, I'm going to be there for an hour or two, and for to shoot a car. And I was like, well, it takes you about five hours to shoot a fork yeah. and that's just a fork that's yeah. a flat surface with no edges hardly so how long does it take to say shoot the cutlery so the cutlery is interesting because um, although it's typically just one light to get the angle of the camera the angle of the of the light and then get the position of the light so that you get because you can you could be a couple inches off it'll disappear you can move it a couple inches the other way and it's too bright, so it's back and Very forth and back and forth right? and back and forth until you get just the look you're looking for, and it's and it uh, takes time. And then uh, once you get the lighting right, then you have to all the positioning. Then you realize that there's dust, and so you got to blow the dust off, and it just goes on and on and on. So it does. It takes hours. It takes to, hours to just dial it all in. So the point of all that is, so when I get back and do post production, all I have to do is a little bit of straightening, a little bit of sharpening, call it done, and everything and everything looks good. Yeah. So um, did you actually, I, I know I didn't sell anything at this. I, I, actually, um, I actually do the first Fridays. I was doing them at my friend Andrew's place um, mm -hmm. down by Roosevelt Row. And right. Susie, myself, Sarah, a bunch of other people from PAC had done first Fridays down there. And the first one I did, I was like, oh, I'm going to make a ton of money and do all this stuff. And you print all this stuff. And then you realize it's not really about that. So I didn't make any sales, but I had a lot of fun talking to everyone, showing my art off, and you're not always talking to photographers like we're used to. You're talking to people that really Just want to know about the people image. People off the street. So, and so we had this meeting before we did the, this first Friday when the second one. Yeah. And we all sat around, and, and you asked everyone, what do you hope to get out of it? And I said, for me, it's just exploratory. Because I hear photographer friends always telling me, you know, my stuff is really good. I'm like, yeah. okay, that's nice, thank you, but your friends? I want to see what random strangers think of my stuff. And so gotcha. it was interesting to see people when they would look down at the, the photos of, it's a photo of a fork. And they would come by and they go, wow, that's really like sensual. And there's something about that makes me want to keep looking at it. So that made me feel good. And that was why I did the display. Gotcha. I did sell one piece, which was great. So 
a cool. bonus, but cool. yeah, that's good. That's good because it, it's not. It isn't cheap to actually do this stuff too. If you're going to do it the right way, some people get them matted, like like Robert came and got stuff matted, printed yeah. big canvases. You know, you could spend hundreds, maybe thousands of dollars to do this, and um, and like anything, it is still sales. So you really don't want to um, just give up after the first one. You may right. have to do this. Um, um, Gary, who was in the hallway, yes. Um, used to do them at Andrews every month. He was like a resident there, and he'd go out and shoot and um, get new content and bring him every month, and he was there every first Friday. It wasn't like, oh, I'll do it. Like, I would just do it every, like, six months. Yeah. And I kind of was, like, in the theme, which was, like, monsoon and black and white and this and that. So whatever theme was going on, we'd go and do that. But uh, Gary was there every month, and I'm sure he sold a lot more than I did the one month I showed yeah, up because do. people saw him, and they saw him again, like, oh, I wanted to buy one last time, and I'm going to yep. finally buy one. And you just, sometimes you just have to wait for that right person to just walk in and go, I have to have that. Yep. You don't know when that person's going to show up, so you have to be there. Yeah, so I found it's, it's good to show to friends and family that don't know what you do. It's yep. good to have your fans come in, like Aurora had all our fans coming in, the D had a bunch of fans coming in. They, yeah. they don't see that besides on Facebook. And when it's on, on this, you're like, oh, cool, there's a fork. Yeah, it looks But when they have a fork like this big. Yeah, and it's a, this big, wide, panoramic look, and it's just a fork, you go, whoa. Yeah. yeah. Um, like and this, Like, this is forking good. This is forking good. <laughs> it's forking interesting. <laughs> Could go out all night, yeah. So, uh, so it was a lot of fun. There was a lot of other uh, photographers that did really well. They got a lot of you know groups. It was fun to see uh, some of the artists who were presenting have a group of people just standing there discussing their work. I thought that was very interesting. Got a lot out of that. I thought that was great. And how many people came to that second one? It was quite a few total. How many people came to the one in September? The one just recent one, yeah. Um, registered. Uh, Susie can answer this on the bottom there. I think we had 150, close to 200 registered, and more people always come through. It's an open free event, it's open free event so yeah. it's not. Uh, everyone doesn't have to register. It helps us plan for food, plan for all kinds of other stuff as far as food and music and room and space and stuff like that. But it's it's not something you have to sign up for. So it help it helps us. And we did some prizes that we actually have to, we're going to be delivering and stuff as well that people had given prizes away. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of the artists would uh, donate something to the raffle. To a raffle, Is that how yeah. it worked? Yeah. yeah. And so we're going to do, going to do another one in November. So first Friday in November. Yes. So that's cool. So um, that's been announced. I think I saw it on Facebook already. Yeah, so what we did is we put it up as the Eventbrite, so people, we just put it up just before, it was like Thursday before the other first Friday, so hopefully no one showed up here for October, so we're doing every other month right. until we get to 2019 or whatever is coming up, um, whatever year is next year. So, so we're going to do November and then it'll be January. And then January, and then we'll reevaluate the situation and really see if we're going to go and do them every month. So I don't want to commit to every month right now towards the end of the year. We're just testing it out. So it was a really good first turnout. But as we go into 2019, it may be a every month kind of thing. Okay. Depending on how many people we can get to exhibit, people want to do repeats. Because you got to fill the place up every time, right? You do. You don't. This studio is going to be offline for two months. So this will probably be open again in January um, because of the show here. So we're going to do a lot of you know bulk recording and different things in here and everything. So... Uh, we we renovated this, so we're going to give you guys a tour one day <laughs> of what yeah, of what so the whole space looks like. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. Uh, we're going to do a, a full walkthrough of the entire studio, bring it back into here, and so you can see see uh, what we did. Like like up above us is still the photography part, so we're able to pull pull the screen out of the way and do demos and have Lindsay come here and shoot her and teach techniques and other things. So it's going to be a very um, active video session that we're going to be doing. Yeah, we'll um, be doing light patterns and types of light and quality of light and got to have a subject. Mostly Lindsay. Otherwise, it's just paper. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's mostly Lindsay or Aurora or people like that that yeah. come in and, and well, want to help out and stuff. And they're pros, and, and so you don't have to do a lot of instruction. You instruction, to, right? So we, we can just do the video and they will they'll do what they're We don't need to do. Michelle here like posing them. They know how to do it and all that. So, uh, so yeah, so we'll, we'll have some new stuff coming out. So, so we'll give you a tour of the studio. Uh, on first Friday, we'll probably have it open so people can look in here, um, but not come in here, just so they can kind of see yeah, that this will be. Take a peek in. Yeah. See, I think what a, a, see what a video studio looks like. See what it looks like, yeah, because, you know, when you guys see this, it's pretty impressive. Um, 
You have all these lights up here, they're all built in. You have the cameras literally built into the walls here. You have uh, the set moves off to the side um, with a big um, rotating stage that we built in here. That's, that's pretty cool. Um, it's what like else? a meal per drum set. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing that's not bolted in is kind of this, right? Is the center camera. Yeah, so, we so, haven't figured so the that out shot's yet. shot's still on a tripod, but yeah. But it's uh, the floor, it's marked on the floor where it belongs, so we can, we can move it and bring it back again. Yep. Put a lot of thought into it. So we added some things. So we had a couple of the, the first one, I think we had a lot of feedback where we asked for feedback on the set. We got some feedback, which was great. Uh, most people still look pretty good, but it looked a little sterile. So we added some, added some props. Back, back in. Yeah, back in from, from the old uh, after hour set. So we need to freshen that up eventually and kind of done with them. <laughs> the 70s look is out. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, let us know if this helps or if we just need to freshen it up. I have to make a run to Ikea. <laughs> right, we need some new Ikea crap. Yeah. Spent thousands in there. So uh, so, so getting back to our next point. So first Friday, it's going to be first Friday in... Yep. Uh, in November. In November, which you said was second? I believe it's the second, yeah. And we open around 6 o'clock. If you're an artist and you want to join us, get in touch with us ASAP. We have three or four artists already on. We need a minimum of five to go through with it to be able to cover the expense of closing the studio down for the night because we have to close all five studios down to um, do this event and we close down the night before a little bit as well so that you can set stuff up and then there is some other things as far as uh, fixing holes in the wall and stuff so if you want to jump on board get on early because we're only going to accept a certain amount this time we're not going to overfill it because we need people for the subsequent months so uh, email PM IG Whatever else is out there, I don't, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. Well, there's a, there's a way to get through. Um, you can even ask a question on the, on the Facebook post for that event, yeah, right? Yeah, just, uh, just ask Susie. Susie's answering questions, I think, and stuff. So, um, so yeah, so enough of First Friday. Yeah, yeah, so let's get into talking. Second Friday. Talking full-frame sensor, the onslaught of the new full-frame sensor mirrorless cameras. And everybody's like, oh, i got to have full-frame, full-frame, full-frame. So there's a time and a place for everything. Yeah, and it's always full frame. And it's always full frame. So <laughs> actually, no, so, so you do the Lumix, so that's a Micro Four Thirds, right? So the Panasonic Lumix is a, is a Micro Four Thirds yeah, sensor. And, and you like the form factor. You like the small, the light, the inexpensive, very light lenses, but they're super sharp. Yes. So you've had a lot of success. We've got a GH5 right there. Yeah, actually, the, this, all this video, all three of these cameras are GH5s as well. Yeah, so this one's actually a... Um, a Lumix G9, so it's same form factor uh, as a GH5, mm -hmm. but uh, you could, this lens is a tw uh, 12 to 60, which is a 24 to 120. You have to do math if you're going to do anything crop. You have to learn math again. So, um, but you can feel how light that is, and the uh, the body is pretty similar size to like say a 7D or something like that. But the lenses are a lot smaller. That lens would smaller. be like double the size and weight on a. Yeah. Uh, yeah so so diameter. It's so because glass is heavy. So the smaller diameter you can make these things, the lighter it's going to be in the end. And also they're they're fairly short for what they are. Uh, I like in, it's it's a nice form factor for for what you were doing. So then Lumix says, okay, well we'll skip that crop sensor. We'll go straight to a full frame. So they've just released one of those. Yeah, and um, like anything, these are tools. So people get really wrapped up in their cameras and get wrapped up in their uh, their gear. So we're and all gear junkies in the end because that's the way it is. Yeah, but it is uh, it is just a tool. So if you were any other kind of contractor, so if you were a, a, a guy doing construction, you have a ball-peen hammer to hang pictures, you have a regular hammer, that's going to let you, you know, nail and frame stuff. And then you have a sledgehammer to destroy stuff. So why, as photographers, do we all have to fit into one little box of this is the way you have to do it? This is the only way. Right. So, so we were talking earlier, before we, before we went on air, about, about this and what we were going to talk about. And you were saying that you really like your small form factor when you're going out and you're doing landscapes and you're hiking because it's light. Mm -hmm. And... You were thinking about getting one of the full frame ones just to keep in the studio to do studio work. 
Yeah, so a, a full frame, um, the times I would use a full frame, because, you know, more is better in certain times, so right. you, more megapixels. So with this camera, one of the, the things I do is I shoot, and I do it all the time with it, all things. Now, if I want to shoot this can, I'm going to shoot this can. I'm not going to shoot the whole table and then crop the can out. Right. I'm going to shoot either both, or if I know that's what the client wants is a picture of this can, I'm going to shoot that in the way that they want it. And it's ready to go. Done. And, and it's ready to go. So. Yeah. You have to do that with a micro thirds because I can't just crop half right. of my image out. Right. So as I'm shooting the can and as I'm doing that shot, I'm working with a client or with myself or whatever. Like when we shot those cameras, I shot the cameras in square exactly the way I wanted them. Right. I didn't have to hardly crop anything out. I cropped very little out just to straighten them because I can't ever shoot a straight shot. No matter how many levels they put in these, levels on my ball heads, totally side thing, it is never straight. I always have to adjust it slightly. It's always just looks off to me. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I could put the line across the middle, I can move the little green dial, everything, it doesn't work. So that's about all I will crop for usually is to just, to just judge it a little bit and get it where I want it. Right. Um, so for hiking, like you mentioned, micro four thirds, why would I want to carry that big 7200 around? I can carry even a smaller camera. I wouldn't even carry this one. I'd take my GX8 or GX9. So, so, so even, this is, so this even is wide big. angle lenses, uh, those wide angle lenses for the full frame cameras, they're heavy. Yeah. It's, there's a lot of glass there. It's a yeah. big diameter glass. Oh, yeah. It's big and heavy. So you even like an, uh, a Nikkor 16 to 35, it's a heavy lens. Yep, yep. I had, uh, I had a Canon with all, f all full frame glass. I had a 5D Mark III with 7200, 24 to 70, 16 to 35. Right. They're all two to $3,000 lenses now. Um, so the price point on these is a lot cheaper too. So I was able to sell my Canon gear and buy several cameras and lenses with it versus a $3,000 upgrade to a, a new 7200 or yep. 16 to 35. Yep. And I, and I think that's a, I think it's an important distinction to make, right? It just, there is a cost factor here. It's a huge cost difference in, in the uh, two times. This is a 2X sensor. Right. Because what's your camera? Yours is a Nikon. It's a 1.5. 1.5. Right. And so just for that, all those still lifes that I do, all those product shots that I do are all done on a crop sensor camera. They are not full frame, they're not medium format. It's if you don't have to crop 24 megapixel, 24 megapixel. See, and if, if you were if you were shooting a full frame, you could shoot models all day long and not forks. There you go. And that's what they sell people on, right? They're like, you're gonna be a real photographer when you get a full frame. Yep. Where it's not, it's just a different tool. So, model, but everyone yeah. is like, I see comments all the time on pack. Oh my God, I, I'm gonna get a full frame. It's like, why? And they're like, I don't know. I was just told I had to get a full frame. Yeah, that's the thing. And people will, they'll and sell I the cameras that way. I, I was, And I got it and I loved it, but it wasn't a necessity. It didn't, it made me crop a lot more because I'm like, shit, I have all this stuff around. I got to get rid of this stuff. The lenses stuff. work different. <laughs> yeah. They, <laughs> you, have, you have like this whole wall, not just that. Yeah. So I went from a 7D to a 5D back to this. And by that time, I had already got my skill level down where if I want to shoot the can, I'm going to shoot the can. So I wasn't leaving all this extra room. Yeah. And I think that, so, so that's what we're talking about, right? So with a smaller sensor, you don't have to crop if you get the shot right the first time. There's enough sensor there to give you. And besides, a lot of this micro four thirds stuff, a lot of what I'm hearing out there in the world is the guys who do video, they love micro four thirds. Oh yeah, it's tiny. They freaking love it. And it's and it's plenty good for video. You can bolt them on walls like we did here. Yeah, well you can shoot 4K with them, they're great. Well actually this one, so the one we have here, this is the G9, it actually has a 4K and a 6K mode. So it does 6K photo, they call it. So I can actually leverage 6K video and as I am shooting photos, it's doing video, and then, then I can pick the photos out of the frames and then export the photo. So if, like, say, um, a deer is running across a field, I can just hold it down and capture the whole sequence and then pick out when it turns and looks at me. Where if you're shooting, you can do high speed, but there's always the chance you're going to miss it in between because some of these are fractions of moments. So, um, oh, yeah. and, and I think Lumix just said that by 2020, they're going to have 8K in the cameras. That's pretty cool. So they're pushing, they're, you know, they've always been innovative and in pushing the bar. Oh yeah, everyone says that. Everyone is, yeah. So you look out there and everyone's like, video? Yeah, get a GH5 and just don't worry about it. Yeah. So it is, they're popular for, that's why these are three GH5s right here that are filming across here. So we have GH5 right here with a long lens yep. and a long lens. So I have Susie's lens on there. 
and I have my lens on here. So they're uh, 35 to hundredths, which are effective focal length of 70 to 200. That's effective, and, that's a good word to use there. And yeah. then this one is a wide angle GH5 back there doing our wide shot. So um, there's a lot of firepower in here for this little show. Yeah. You have, you, have you guys a, appreciate that. <laughs> So, but they're all they're all GH5s, and we're actually not recording on here. We're recording out to a Sling Studio, which, which is, is what's also kind of cool. So that's what the iPad here is for. If you see down in this area, and we're switching the cameras ourselves. We just drag. We can see on this side of the the iPad, we can see all the cameras, and while someone's talking, we can switch to either the wide shot or either one of close-up shots. We it's have no cool. friends. We have to switch ourselves. Yeah, either that or we have to get someone sitting on the floor because that's where the iPad get is. A little like miniature person here. <laughs> to like hit it. See, now all the haters are going to come out. <laughs> Talked about miniature people. <laughs> They're called dwarves. Miniature people. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Let's so get back to cameras before we get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so full frame. So, so there are some benefits to a full frame sensor. So a full frame sensor will let you do a couple things. You can actually get your depth of field is a lot creamier in it. And you... I can get it with my with my camera here, but what happens is at a regular depth of field that would be around 2.8, I'd have to go down to like 1.4, 1.7 to get that separation between my background. So, that, you know, as long as you know how to cheat the system, you can you can work within it. Yep. So basically, when you're shooting 2.8, you're going to get 2.8. You're going to get that nice creamy background you're expecting. Um, I can't, I can't crop as much as I'd like to, so I do that all on camera, so the way I'm seeing it. And then something else I'm doing is uh, when I want more megapixels, I do a panoramic. So I'll be like, click, 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 click. You could do two, three, four rows, whatever you want, and I can get a huge image, way bigger than just being lazy and shooting one shot because, oh, I have a full frame. So I'm getting giant images by, and I don't get it on the tripod. I'm not like, let's get it all perfect and lined up. I'm freaking the laziest panoramic person ever. I'm literally, I just overlap more and I'm just like 50% like click, 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 and then click, and then whatever I lose, I lose. I'm, you know, I don't, I'm not, I'm not a really technical photographer. Like you're sitting there with a the fork for hours doing all this stuff, doing all the technical stuff. To me, I'm just like, I want to capture the moment I want more megapixels, so I'm gonna like do what I can to get this shot. And oh, I, this is really pretty. I might print this. Let me shoot more than just my single frame. Yeah. So that's cool. Yeah, you're right though. So what I'm doing my stuff, I don't even want to touch the camera. Oh yeah, you, you tether and then I just tether have and it. trigger from my from my laptop. Yeah, yeah, I don't even want to touch it. But yeah, and so we had Mark Morris on a couple of weeks ago from Tamron Lenses, and he was talking about we talked about the we used the, he used the term photo sites and the pixel itself and what's on there. Mm -hmm. And so with the larger the sensor, the larger the pixel. So if you have a micro four thirds, 24 megapixel, and a APS-C, 24 megapixel, and a full frame, 24 megapixel, they're not all the same. The pixel itself gets larger, okay. which means you get more information per pixel. And that is, so the, the medium format guys, when they do fashion and they need great skin tones, the even bigger again, and that's why there's 100 megapixels on those things because their pixels are bigger. They have more information per yeah, pixel. Yeah, so we're, we were talking about like medium format and stuff, and like Fuji is actually um, Fuji's coming out with the medium format yeah. sensors for their cameras, and they're not full medium formats like you would have back in the day, but they're kind of hybrid, kind of. Yeah, think of it as a crop sensor micro uh, full uh, medium format. So it's a crop sensor medium format. So yep. even bigger than full frame, so we won't go down that, but it's pretty interesting, and it's, again, they're innovating. Yeah, they are. Bringing the prices down, bringing the technology down for and everyone. it's mirrorless. What? And it's a mirrorless body as well. It's mirrorless, and it's not 30 grand. There's that. Yeah, that's two <laughs> wins right in a row. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 yeah, even beyond the full frame, you can even go bigger for people that really do need those photo sites and all that information. Yeah. Yep. So it's going to be interesting. So, so when, when does a crop sensor come in handy? Like, why was that even, besides cost, when, why was that really invented? Like, so do you use it at, to your advantage when you're shooting your stuff? No, mine was, mine was purely cost. It was, it was less expensive. And, uh, and to be honest, just a lot of the uh, um, crop sensor lenses are cheaper than, than the full frame ones and lighter. 
and lighter, yeah. It's just all those things are there, yeah. And I could also use a full frame lens on there. So I, I have the, a macro lens yep. that I use. I've got a 51.4 that I use, and those are all full frames, and they work. You get that effective, there's a word again, that effective uh, zoom yeah. with the crop factor, which when I'm doing portraits is interesting because I now have to back up further. <laughs> Everyone else is standing closer, and I have to back up more because I'm, I'm, I'm cropped in more, but I'm used to it. I know when I go to do something, if I use a 50, it's an effective 75 millimeters. Yeah, Susie was speaking up in... Uh, up in uh, Connecticut when we were up there for, or was it Connecticut? Massachusetts. Massachusetts, yeah. yeah. She was up, we're up in Massachusetts. We were, she was speaking at a conference, and Lumix was there, and we borrowed a 200. They have a brand new uh, Leica branded 200 millimeter, which is super sharp, um, and it's effective 400. <laughs> so she's like across the room, yeah. like literally across like Studio One, like 40 feet away. And she's like, yeah. excuse me, excuse me, can you move? <laughs> People don't know that she's trying to get a shot. Like she talked in a model and she walked away, across yeah. and she's still getting headshots out of it because it's 400 millimeter. Crazy, yeah. It was across a big ballroom and uh, it was kind of funny because I was like, excuse me, she's taking the picture from back. Like, oh, we didn't see you back there. She's like, <laughs> they're like, why don't you like get <laughs> closer? The dark. She's like, I can't. <laughs> But it was like she was just trying to test the lens out, get a few yeah. images to look on the computer. She wasn't trying to do a whole photo shoot, but it was just kind of funny because she was. It, she sounded like that photographer. I was like, get out of my way. Get out. She was just like, but she talked to the model, walked all the way back. And by that time, other people were like, oh, cool. They're no just shooting the model. In. Yeah, because it's that environment. <laughs> just water in. So uh, it, was, it was interesting. But yeah, that's, that's the thing. Good wildlife lens, though. So another yeah. reason to leverage it, right? So you have a, uh, you have a wildlife reason. So if you're shooting a... 200 you're at 400 and you shouldn't have 400 like she has a 400 it's an 800 effective so you're getting closer without the bear eating your face off yeah and how much does that weigh um not, not much, much. I, exactly. i'd say the 100 to 400 that she has is lighter than my 70 to 200 canon i used to have it's pretty crazy yeah so so there is definite weight cost and other benefits um i think the the parts that you have to take into consideration are I'd say event photographers would have to be careful with higher ISOs. Smaller sensors don't handle the low light conditions as well as a full frame sensor. So you get a little more noise is what you're saying. You get a little more noise. Uh, so like if you're shooting stars or dark, dark weddings or something like that, churches where it's really dark, you can't add lights like this. Um, you're going to be bumping up the ISO. But even on my full frame, I didn't like to go super, super like above 3200 I was always like yeah 3200 maybe 6400 and I, I never liked it even with my full frame so um, do you find that problem with yours at all I don't what I do I look forward to on, on a larger sensor the larger sensor thing gives you gives you this one more thing and it's dynamic range and then they're working really hard on the smaller sensors to, to get better dynamic range but still the bigger the sensor the better dynamic range because the pixels are bigger so um, Ten pixels. I would like, yeah, so so with what I would do, I would like to see some more dynamic range in, with what I do. Um, and so that's why I'm starting to consider maybe a larger a larger sensor just, just for that alone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the mirrorless thing is interesting because camera shake is a problem, right? Because I'm on a tripod and I want to camera shake and I don't trigger it. But oftentimes when I'm going to do a couple of shots and composite them together, just the mirror slap. We'll mess it up. We'll mess up the alignment, and so now I've got to tweak the alignment on an image that I didn't want to crop. So it's a problem. So I'd like to like get rid of that mirror slap and, and then just have a camera that I don't have to worry about it. One of the one of the things that I like about about these cameras is when I'm focusing on you, I focus peaking too, so I can manually focus all of these before we do the shot, and I can see visually on all the edges. Um, you get the sparkly green or blue or yeah. whatever color I pick. Yep. That's a very cool thing. And, and a lot of these new cameras that have come out are, are doing all this focus peaking. They're doing face detection. Some of them are doing eye detection. It's very interesting. Uh, the the Fuji, the X-T3, yep. um, has this pupil thing. And you can set up whether it sees a face, whether you want the left eye, the right eye. It's, close to, it's crazy. Nice. There's yeah. a whole menu system just for which, which eye to focus on. It's, it's unbelievable. Yeah, it's, it's fairly reliable. Not 100% because it's new. Yeah. But, you know, and, and the nice thing with all these modern cameras is they are computers. Firmware updates can fix some of this stuff. 
I actually haven't updated these yet, but there is a firmware, two firmware updates. I think one that already rolled out for Lumix and then another one. What's cool about all the cameras besides Canon and Nikon is they put shit in there for us. Like we just get stuff like, oh, by the way, you have this feature now that you didn't have. Like, like cool. Like we just updated like, iOS and it's like we get stuff. You're like, oh, yeah. that works different and this works different. I don't have to close the apps the way I used to. Exactly. It's like, so why not, right? The computer's there. It's in your hand. You're taking pictures with it. Yep. Yep, just a quick upload. Like focus stacking. We didn't have focus stacking, and now you do. And it's like, that's cool. I didn't have that. I didn't pay for that, but it was free, and it was on a firmware update. So so it wasn't one of the things that uh, Lumix did was uh, as a firmware update was the uh, uh, tethering? The GH, yeah, we did the video on that, yeah. yeah. So the GH5 didn't tether when I got it, and then they actually made it so it tethered. And then this one tethers already, so like, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't built in and it rolled out, which was super excited because I went. That was my biggest thing that I lost going from Canon to that was I couldn't tether anymore. I could do an HDMI out and see it on the screen, but you're making your clients dizzy, and it's like anytime you move, you were just seeing a live feed on the screen of what it was. So, so when you're doing this, that's zooming back and forth. Yeah. On so so I was kind of doing that. And then when they came out with the 5 and the update firmware to the 5, mm -hmm. I was able to regular tether right into a little mini program that sends it up to Lightroom. Yeah, so it, it goes to a little live program, which you would like. You were saying yours, you're missing the um, where you can live see it on the screen. Live I don't use tether, that. Yeah. yeah, you want that to be able to adjust the product to where you product want it. Or little bounce cards, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah so I, I don't use that. I just open the little program, close it, and then I actually use just Lightroom to just see. And I don't even use those images when I tether. Those are just getting dumped um, because I use my card at home on my bigger iMac to edit. Yeah, yeah, perfect, right? Yeah, yeah so I don't care what goes onto the laptop. That laptop's just um, for teaching and sure. putting but this But the, but the point is that you can get new features just with firmware. Yeah, like yeah. that's a big feature. That's it, like, it, uh, hey, I bought a camera and it doesn't do this tethering thing, and now it does. And now it, it, it didn't do focus stacking, and now it does. So, both of those were huge updates. You're like, what? I, yeah. I didn't, I didn't even pay for that, and now I got it. And I don't know how many other camera manufacturers are doing, but I don't think the Canon and Nikon boys actually do that. It's usually just bug fixes that they do with firmware updates. Maybe. And you don't get them very often. Yeah, maybe. Even Sony, I think. I don't think you get a lot of extra features. Mm -hmm. what you get is what you get, and hey, you want the new one? Buy the new one. Yeah. What is that? Another 3500 bucks. That's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> come one, come all. Yeah, just, just, so. keep, just keep buying. Just pay, pay, pay. Uh -huh. So um, uh, what are we going to have coming up? So we had on our list here for next time that we might actually have uh, some stuff to start reviewing again. Doing some gear reviews, yeah. We'll, we'll get some stuff People together. seem to like that. They like to see what's out there. Yeah, maybe some unboxing stuff. We can get some new stuff in. I understand there's a... There's a, a, a Nick. We'll call it a Nikon Z7 on its way. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, so we are Canadian uh, friends. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. So the the Nikon uh, Z7. Z7. Yep. That's coming in from uh, B and H to have you review that and everything. So we'll have a video, a first look on that, and then yep. you'll probably do a, a blog on it. Yep. Uh, we have a Mindshift uh, satchel bag that I have that. I've been using and testing out in real life. So and is it like a messenger bag style? A yeah, bag? yeah, and I didn't know if I was going to like it. Um, and I actually do like it. I, I've always had a backpack, and this I, I was taking some getting used to and stuff because you kind of stack stuff inwards versus just open the backpack. Mm -hmm. But um, you could set it down and just grab your camera and That's shoot, where cool. the other one you have to unzip the whole thing. This I unclip one thing, take it out, and I'm shooting like yeah. the sunset last night. Um, it just happened and I like, ran down to the guard, got the camera and I'm running up, unclipping it, taking it out and shooting where if it was on my back, I had to lay it down in the dirt and stuff and then unzip the whole top of it and it's just yeah. not a quick, easy kind of thing. Yeah. So, so you, you've seen the bag I use. It's a, it's a shoulder bag. Yeah. Uh, one of the donkey bags. Okay. Yeah, canvas and it's, and it's quick because what am I doing? I'm going from the car into the studio. Yeah. I don't need a backpack for that. Yeah. See, and the bigger the bag, um, so the bigger the bag, I find I carry too much crap then. Even in that, it's too big. So I went to all these small cameras, then I carry like all these cameras with me. I'm like, well, I have five cameras just in case. 
a volcano blows up and I need four or five different angles. So what are you saying? The small form factor doesn't work when you can fit five of them in the bag? Yeah, when you can fit five <laughs> of the cameras. Comes back up again. It was like, okay, I could take all the lenses off and I could stack all these cameras in the bottom. And then you're like, wait, why do I need four or five cameras? So I was carrying like a GH5 and a G9 and a GX8. And then, you know, I always like a camera to back up if I go on a trip or on a gig. But um, then you end up having to be like, well, I can fit like six lenses in here now because they're this big. So yeah. you tend to just grab too much stuff. <laughs> That's funny. So, uh, so yeah, we're going to talk about the bag. We'll eventually talk about the Nikon camera. Yeah, we'll get some camera. stuff in here. We'll talk about um, it. You know, I'm hoping to get a hold of the, the Lumix uh, full-frame camera, ho nice. uh, hopefully before that gets actually put out, so we can show that, do a hands-on, an actual yeah. full-fledged full -fledged review with that. Maybe a little comparison. Comparison. Um, I've I've played with the Canon one at the Portrait Masters conference, and okay. that was um, similar, very similar feel. A friend of ours already got the Nikon here and felt that, so they're almost um, very feel about this. It's kind of the same grip as this. That they have the same little thing that sticks out. It's almost this form factor that I already have here. Yeah. So cool. uh, and the and the new Lumix looks sort similar to this. I looked at pictures of it, I'm like, wow, it's like my G9, but with a big sensor. With so, a big sensor. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. So heavy, heavier. So, so to be decided, is it a buy the camera you need? Oh <laughs> yeah, we do really. I think that's where we're going to end up with this. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you what do you do? So um, everyone, all your, I don't know, all your friends, all your family, all your photo friends, like you have to go full frame, but they don't always tell you why. So you really need to look at your needs of what you need. If you're shooting wildlife or you're shooting stuff that you need that extra little reach you know, don't go with the full frame because now you're going to be cropping stuff out you don't need. If you're shooting uh, weddings or you're shooting um, group photos, we need that extra width and that extra space that you don't want to back up as far like you were talking about, then the full frame might be for you. Um, some people do one of each. Like I had one of each. I had a full frame and a crop and I bought all EF lenses so everything would fit across. And that's kind of what I'm doing again now is I'm going to probably not have all these GH5s, have a G9 or one GH5 and a full frame. That's so cool. I have different tools for the job. It's not a one size fits all all the time really. Yeah. And, and I think that's what people get lost in. They're like, oh, I've arrived. They've gotten a full frame. Well, okay, then when are you going to get to a medium format? When you get to a full medium format, where does it end then? You know, yeah. it's like, where are you, where are you going with this? It's, it's not a you have arrived kind of thing. It's like, no. okay, I have a sledgehammer and I have a ball peen hammer. Do I want to put a picture up? I'm not yep. going to grab the sledgehammer. I'm going to go take the little hammer and yep. put the little nail on the wall. But I think, in, you know, a lot of people cannot afford to have several cameras. They have the camera that they have. And so I think you just need to d decide how you want to use that camera, what are you going to do with it, and which form factor works the best for you. And there's been some of the, uh, uh, some of the pack members have come in, and they're like, why are my cameras so heavy? I'm tired of my heavy camera. And they've gone to one. Yeah. And because they're carrying her out, they're doing the landscape, they're all shooting the wild horses, that kind of thing. And Oh, we've, we've had a lot of people turn to uh, Fuji, yep. to Lumix, to Olympus, Olympus um, because too, of yeah. those reasons, because of the weight. And if you're going to go out and you're going to shoot and crop it right in the camera, you don't need that weight. So yep. I know a lot of people, um, you know, one, the reasons I switched over originally was back problems, my wrist problems, so and Susie as well. So there was like, it was a weight factor, but it was also like, okay, well, I'm carrying all this gear around. When I get to a certain spot, I'm exhausted. Yeah. I wasn't inspired to go shoot Delicate Arch. I just want to freaking nap and... and Have or, something to eat. Yeah, yeah and <laughs> can go back to the air conditioning in the car. So like, now if I can you know, carry two cameras out and have one doing a time lapse while I'm shooting the other one, you have that, that energy when you're there to do that. And I'm carrying two cameras and it's lighter than one camera. Yep. So if I'm going to go hike out the Delicate Arch, I'm probably not going to bring that full frame camera. I'm going to bring this one and shoot the pano of it and be happy enough with that. Right. Yep. And then there's, then there's some people that, you know, they just, they think that in, in for what the type of work they're going to do, they need the larger sensor. They want all that more information for whatever reason. They need that inf extra information. They want that extra dynamic range, and that's the tool for them. It's all out there. Well, you don't, uh, see, you don't want to be, you know, like a lazy photographer either. So, like, no. you don't want to shoot, again, this whole table to get a picture of this camera. No. You know, so, so you'll see a lot of people, like, oh, I can fix that later in Photoshop. I can crop that out later. And that's not the purpose of that full frame sensor is to just be lazy with your photography. No, no, I wasn't suggesting that. I'm yeah. just saying that if that's what you need for that shot, yeah. like I said, I'm looking for more dynamic range. 
that kind of thing, then that, yeah, then then that helps me. Yeah, then it's the time to go to it. Yeah, and that's really all they they can put in a lot of these cameras is more dynamic range, better ISO handling. What else do we really need? What is what on all these cameras we have? You have, I have. What else are they really improving? What else? All the bells and whistles. I hardly use any of them. These aren't even recording to cards right now. They're all going to this Link Studio. They're just mirrors into us. Right. They're literally sending HDMI signals out wirelessly yep. out, out to that box, which is recording on one card, so that when we edit it, it's all on one card, it's all in layers. Like literally, they're, the capabilities that these things can do are far superior than what we're using for right now. Absolutely, yeah, we're only using a fraction of it. Yeah, like, yep. like not even, like yep. it's not even recording. <laughs> <laughs> like they're literally not even recording, no, right? it's just passing through. It's passing all that data through yeah. to a hard drive or a card somewhere else. So yep. um, are you really using more than the three or four things you need? White balance, ISO, um, shutter, and aperture. It's, we set them and then that's it. Which this can do the same thing as all of those. It can. So this has all the same settings that I need to, to work that I use on my digital cameras. So like when we go do film photo walks, like we're going to do, um, I think next weekend, right? It's the, this it's weekend? The, is it this weekend, 13th? So we're doing a film photo walk, and you bring a film camera out. It's and it's gonna, heavy. And it's heavy, <laughs> and you can do all the same things that you're gonna, most people are going to do on their digital. Actually, for a lot of things, film is more forgiving than, than the digital sensors. You just get, the, get that... Exposure close. Yeah. And shoot. And drop one of these and see what happens. And I drop mean, one of those, you're going to break a toe. Yeah. You're going to hurt <laughs> something. Yeah. But I mean, the whole Sunny 16 thing. And shoot. You I can hope. do that with a film camera. Yeah. You're not going to have very good luck with a, with a digital camera doing that. They're much more critical. I mean, it's like third of a stop. If you look at, if you look at that Mamiya camera, I don't even think you can do thirds of a stop on shutter speed, can you? It's full full stops on the shutter speed. There's no. <laughs> Susie's texting me. It says, "I do want some of the bells and whistles." <laughs> she get no bells and no whistles so, from so us. So, so Susie's coming in. I don't know if she's typing this stuff, but I get stuff. Um, evidently, Scott's too quiet, but she sound you sound good to me. Yeah, I sound well. You sound, sound pretty good. I can hear myself. <laughs> and she goes, Susie. Uh, is is moderating so she's probably answering your questions and stuff so it says here i do want some of the bells and whistles touch focus so she likes the touch focus on um, the mirrorless camera especially the lumixes have touch focus and i do love that yeah, so i can look the, most, through most of the newer cameras in the past year or so are, are doing that but these have had touch screens For from years, day one from day one this yeah. is the 10th year they've been making micro four thirds and yeah. it's always had it so it's kind of funny when they're like oh we're the first ones like to have touch focus, and it's like, what? It's like, how did you even make that up? Um, she's saying bracketing, which most of them have bracketing, but you can do it manually, but you know, we can build it all in, do three, five, seven, yeah, stuff yeah. like that. And she's talking about the 4K burst and pre-burst. So what pre-burst is, is it'll actually take stuff into the past. It's like back to the future, I don't know. It's like, so That's when you, fun. so like if someone's <laughs> doing a pitch, and you didn't start it right away, it's already recording as you pick it up, and as you hit it, it's also recorded what you oh, missed. so when you do that pre-focus partial press, it's, it's already it's recording? It's already going, and then so it'll kind of pre-burst that in. So in that 4K and 6K we talked about is a, uh, a feature of it's a feature of the 4K video where it's actually taking it and you're getting all of those high quality frames and then you can export them as photos, which yeah. is super cool. And I think that's where photography is going. Uh, you know, they're, they're ahead of the game on that. But think about it. If you can capture every frame of a sequence of you moving something and moving all your lights, you can literally put it on like say 6K and you can move your bounce cards around and then pick the one that you like or pick several out and then take them and put them together. Yep. You can so. do those kinds of things. Yep. And so that, that brings up one point. So we talked mostly stills tonight. And a lot of the cameras that are out now, the new cameras, when you see a review, the first thing everyone wants to talk about is how good is the video, the video functions. And, you know, is it, is it 10 bit? Is it this? Is, do we have all these different logs? I don't know anything about it. Yeah. But they have all these different uh, modes that it'll run in. And why didn't they put this in? And why didn't they put that one in? And yeah. Do everyone wants 4K 60, and it's getting crazy that DSLRs are becoming more of a video camera than a stills camera now. 
Yeah, so the difference between this and the GH5s, this G9 and the GH5s, is the fact that this is more of a photo camera. They took some of the video features out where they're, they're selling that to the video people. So they've kind of split, and they're splitting again now with the full frame where it's like, okay, here's your photo. If you're a photographer primarily, you can do video with this, but this, they took out some of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And then if you're doing video primarily, the GH5 and that series GH6 and whatever else comes out would be your main thing. Yeah. And now the full frame, which there's two versions of that too, a lower megapixel and higher megapixel one. So it's gonna give photographers Wait, a lot so, of so options. So why do they do that? Why do they make a, why do they make a, a lower megapixel? Hybrid? Is one more of a video camera than the other and one's more of a stills camera? I mean, I don't know why, I'm seeing a lot of that. Yeah. Nikon did it, Canon decided not to. They went with like a 30 some megapixel, 31, 32, whatever it was. Um, but yeah. a lot of them are doing that now. They're coming up with one that's like a, a low light lower. one and a high resolution one. Yeah, I don't know. You can't have the best of the video worlds. guys. I don't know. The person that makes one that's both is going to so make So let's have some <laughs> comments on now. Let's find out what the video people want to do. If you're a videographer out there and using DSLR, let's find out what, what's going on there. Leave some comments. We'll get back to you on it. But yeah. All right. So we will uh, we'll start to wrap this up because uh, we've been talking for way too long and we need dinner at now. some point. <laughs> well, we don't have to clean up, so it's good. I know. This is cool. This is uh, our, our cool personal little video studio for uh, next uh, 45 days or so. Yeah. So and then, uh, then we get kicked out. Sucks. <laughs> So we set it back up again, right? <laughs> yeah. So um, so anyway, so tell us your thoughts. Uh, this is interactive. Hopefully, you've been answering and asking questions on there. We'll answer them. It'll be live up here. Um, we're going to be uh, rolling out more of these um, as some beta test up through like November 1st, and then um, be doing some more stuff with the YouTube channel as well. So these Facebook, Facebook Lives are fun, but if you guys don't ask questions, there's really no point to us going live. We can just edit them all and put them on YouTube. So be sure to ask questions, interact, talk with us. Um, yes, you too, Patrick. Um, he's very interactive with us the whole time, which... <laughs> he's so lifelike, isn't he? <laughs> uh, we, we, we've had him on before. It's great. Yeah. You know, he's, he's, he's great. So but he's into to, it. it yeah. But we're going to have guests like we've been doing. We had yeah. we had Tether. We had Mark. We're going to be ideas. able to have guests on the fly. Someone flies into town. If you're flying into town, let us know. We f fire these cameras up. Uh, we finkle with the ball head for an hour, and then we get going. Yeah, we'll let you talk. <laughs> so cool. Leave some comments. We'll see you real soon. And uh, what else? What else do we have it. to talk about? So, uh, so we're good. Thank you to Parkwood and Pac and us and you and anyone yeah. else. Especially you guys. Especially you guys, yeah. Uh, the, the people that are watching us, you guys are our fans, and we love to do this and want to continue doing this. So thanks again, and that light didn't die, so go light. So bonus. <laughs> All right, we're we'll signing off next time. We're signing off now. All right, bye guys.